And we're gonna start with a Bible verse out of Acts 28 that's gonna reveal to you your purpose, okay? Acts 28, 31 says, boldly and without hindrance, I love that, boldly and without hindrance, the apostle Paul preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. So what did the apostle Paul teach? He had two main messages that he liked to teach the kingdom of God, and he liked to preach about the Lord Jesus Christ. Two most important messages of Paul, okay? Now, but, but the, you know, Lord Jesus Christ, that makes sense, okay, his message on that, but what is this kingdom of God stuff? I mean, it just kind of sounds like a weird, abstract, philosophical concept. What is the kingdom of God? What is that teaching all about? Well, when you think of a kingdom, what do you think of? Like, if I said the kingdom, like the magic kingdom, right? You think of Disney, and you think of the castle, right? So kingdoms always have castles. Usually kingdoms also have a king on a throne. Some people will think of like Lord of the Rings, a king sitting on a throne, like a kingdom. And what, what really is a kingdom, right? It's, it's, it's a, what does a king do from the throne? He, he makes laws over the domain. What, what are the rules and the laws of a kingdom, right? It's a domain under the influence of a king. So when we talk about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, it means an area ruled by heaven, And here's the thing, when you and I become a part of a kingdom, what we are doing is we are now ambassadors. We are literally people creating a domain that God can inhabit, okay? So essentially, we're we're creating a domain where the rules and realities that exist in heaven will somehow exist right here amidst uh, amidst our lives, amidst our homes. Now, have you ever traveled internationally and had to cross through customs before? It can be kind of intimidating, uh, especially in certain countries. Uh, Not too long ago, my wife and I were traveling overseas. We did one of those, like, have you ever done one of those, like, never-ending flights over the ocean where you lose all track of sanity and time, and you don't even know where you are, who you are, and when you are totally and thoroughly exhausted, now you've got to go through a customs interview to enter into a country, and we, we happen to be going through a customs interview in a country that is notorious for human rights violations, okay? So this is not the type of country where you'd wanna get locked up or anything like that, okay? So we get off of this flight, I'm exhausted, and and my wife Carolyn and I were going through uh, uh, this interview process with with this foreign country's customs, okay? And uh, they started interrogating us, and all of a sudden, like this, this security came running towards my wife. This alarm went off. They surrounded her. They started ripping open her stuff, and they started pulling out bags of white powder from her bags. And I'm looking at my wife thinking, what the heck? Like, what, what, what is going on? And my wife looks at me with horror on her face, and she goes, Peter, I wasn't thinking And, you know, like, they're pulling me away from her as she's saying this. And I'm like, what do you mean you weren't thinking? (laughs) You know, like, what is happening? In my mind, I'm freaking out. Like, I'm thinking, what is, they're pulling bags of white powder out of her bag. And and I'm like, what do you mean you weren't thinking? And, and, and like, immediately I thought, oh, no, I'm going to be on Locked Up Abroad, the TV show. Have you ever seen that? You know what I mean? Like, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, like, every second they're interrogating me, my, like, I'm rethinking everything. I'm not going to be known as Pastor Peter anymore. I'm going to be known as Prison Pete. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm thinking, can I, you know, can I, can I still pastor my church from the jail of a foreign country? Like, I'm, like, I'm in dark places already. Okay, so I immediately, I'm telling the officer, officer, there's got to be some mistake. I mean, you have to understand, you know, like, you know, we're Christian pastors, okay? I'm playing the pastor card, you know what I'm saying? Because I sure ain't going to tell him I'm a DJ, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, that's not going to work. So... I'm like, I'm a, I'm a pastor. I, like, we're, we're, we, we're, we're Christians. We would never, you know, do... And he's looking at me like, yeah, right. Okay, yeah, sure, all of the smugglers say they're Christians. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, you know, but I'm like, no, there's got to be a mistake. And, and, and he goes, really, you're a pastor, huh? And Because and, you don't look like a pastor. And, of course, at the time, I happened to have my nose ring in. And, uh, you know, and so he's not buying it at all. And he goes, well, okay, if you're a pastor then... What is the name of your church? <laughs> ah, Peter, why are you so creative? 
substance. <laughs> oh, I have never wanted to go home more in my life. You know, have you ever just wanted to go back home and just put your hoodie up and just sit there? Why? Because it's your comfort zone. It's where you can, you, it, you're comfortable, it's your ritual, or at least my home country, I can explain to people what I do. You know, like, I, I just, in my mind, I'm freaking out. Well, long story short, my wife is really into vanilla protein shakes. And she thought it would be efficient to pour this protein powder into multiple bags. She's a very, very pure individual, you know? Needless to say, we made it out. We slayed Prison Pete. And how many of you know we don't travel with bags of white powder anymore? <laughs> we stopped that. Now, I say that because every domain has a different set of rules and a different set of realities. And when you enter that domain, you got to be ready to experience some of those realities. And the same is true with the domain of heaven, the kingdom of God, right? So if we crossed into the kingdom of heaven today, the, the, if we crossed into heaven, would we have sickness? Yes or no? No. Why? Because sickness is, a not, is not a part of heaven's domain. How do we know that? Revelation 21.4 says in heaven, Revelation 21.4, there shall be no more death nor sorrow, nor crying, and there shall be no more pain. Does that sound good to anybody? Yes. These are the values of the kingdom. These are the dictates of the king. And so, listen, as the kingdom expands, guess what? So do those realities expand, which is why John the Baptist, when he was preaching, the kingdom of heaven is near, what was he basically saying? He's saying, hey, listen, the power of sickness, death, and sadness is being broken. Why? Because there's an invading kingdom. And when Jesus taught about the kingdom, what would he do? He'd pray for the sick to demonstrate the realities of heaven are now pouring forth wherever we submit to him. In other words, we're creating a place called home every time we surrender because those realities are now pouring out into us. Now, here's the thing. We can actually expand that kingdom by surrendering to Jesus in our personal physical homes, and we can do it through our church homes, okay? So if you show up here and you're in the kids' ministry and it's lacking peace, well, you know peace is a kingdom value, and so you expand the kingdom of peace into that domain, okay? We need people. All of us need to participate in expanding the domain of the king. That's what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God. Now, I, I say that because how many of you know it takes time, it takes energy, it takes finances, it takes discomfort to create a home, okay? To create a home, it takes time and energy. Like, for example, my wife and I just moved uh, like a year ago, and I forgot how exhausting moving is. I mean, packing all your stuff up in boxes, and then it's really humbling when people have to carry that one broken shovel that you still decided to hang on to, and they're like, why do you hold on to your junk? And then you're like, I don't know. And then, you know, like it's humbling, right? But then like all of a sudden, you have to think of where to put it, and then it takes energy to create a home. And then putting everything to get that comfort zone back up, right? Like I was looking at it, and we none of our furniture Fed, and then like, you know, I had to spend all this money on shower curtains, and you're like, do I even need shower curtains? Okay, yeah, yeah, I do. Okay, but it costs money, right? And I didn't want to spend money on a shower curtain, but you have to, right? It takes money to create a home. The same thing is true with a church home. When my wife and I planted the church, it took sacrifices, it took emotion to create a home for lost people to experience the kingdom of heaven. But let me tell you, just by, by having a church service, it's no guarantee that the kingdom of heaven is gonna be there. I think we've all been to churches where it doesn't feel like heaven. You know what I'm saying? Just because you do a church service doesn't mean it feels like a place called home. And I say this because I think all of us have to learn how to create a place called home everywhere we go in our personal homes, in our church homes. And I, I think about the early days of substance um, one of the reasons why I love Hope City is because it reminds me of Substance 10 years ago. We were portable in all of our locations, 
and we had to do set up, tear down in every location, which gets really old when it gets down to 30 below zero. I mean, you do load in, load out at 30 below zero. Let me just tell you something. You know, you have to be committed, right? And so, you know, we, we basically did two services at a portable 1300 seater every Sunday, two services at a portable 750 seater, and then we did a service at a 300 seater, and we had outgrown all of that, and we needed to launch a fourth campus. And of course, a lot of our volunteers were like, oh, we need more people to create a place for this. We need more people to help create a place called home, but we just, you know, we knew it was going to cost something, and so we were actually doing a fundraiser for our fourth campus, Um, and yet, you know, what was weird is, is as we were saving up for this building, though, it was pretty rough because our, our church income was not maybe what a lot of people would think. At the time, I was really scared to talk about money because, you know, it can be awkward. A lot of times people get mad at pastors when they talk about it. Uh, a guy actually came up to me and he said, Pastor, you're a DJ and you're a pastor, but you know what part of your calling you're missing? And I'm like, what? He goes, you need to become a bank robber. And I was like, why, why would, uh, he goes, you're a DJ and you're a pastor, but you need to become a bank robber. And I'm like, well, why? Because you know what bank robbers, DJs, and pastors all have in common? They all say, let me see those hands, everybody on the floor, and give me your money. Some of you are like, wait, no, you just you think about the Venn diagram, just uh, it crosses over, okay. No, like, show me those hands, right? And, and I, I thought, okay, that's weird. And, you know, but, but here's the thing. I, I think a lot of people would get mad at pastors. They'd be like, you know, like, you know, I, I didn't feel comfortable talking about it, okay? And, and I, I realized that, like, you know, Part of it was, at the time, we had thousands of people coming, but we had zero, zero people giving. I mean, literally, it was so bad that, that when we sent out thank you notes to our top 100 givers, my, like, we didn't even have a top 100 when we broke 2,000. And uh, we had 80 people giving anything. And then uh, the most depressing thing was when we sent out a thank you note to, our, to those people, guess who was one of our top givers? My nine-year-old daughter. Okay, when I got her, the letter in the mail for my nine-year-old, I'm like, my first thought was, where is she getting the money? <laughs> and then my next thought was, oh my gosh, is it really that bad? You know, like, it, is, is it really that bad? And, uh, and, and it was, you know what I'm saying? Like, we didn't, we didn't have anything. I, I, you know, the, the funny thing is, is that at the time, you know, my wife and I lived in a small ranch house in a very bad neighborhood. A lot of people assume that, like, megachurch pastors are loaded, but... Mm, I wasn't one of them, you know. I was still driving a rusty minivan with missing hubcaps, you know what I'm saying? I called it the loser cruiser because it just not only did it look terrible, but uh, like none of the doors would work. Like literally, you, you had to roll down the window to open the handle from the outside, and then like the, the side door, you had to do the hatchback. Kids, jump out the back, you know what I'm saying? Like, come on, some of you, you know it because you drove up in it today. Come on, just be proud, be proud. You know, but, but I, at the time, though, it, you know, all five of us had to, of my family members, had to share a single bathroom with a pedestal sink, okay? And, uh, and three of the five of our family members are girls, and so when those curling irons came out, let me just tell you, there was no room in there, okay? And so, you know, people had this idea of, you know, like what their pastor really was living, but part of it was I kept going all in with the church. I just wanted to seed the kingdom, okay? So at the time, you know, we were saving up for a new house because I was just dying to have my own bathroom. I just didn't want to shower in shifts on Sunday morning, and I was dying for my own bathroom, but at the same time, we were taking up this fundraiser for our fourth campus, and so, um, you know, the day before the offering, I realized, wow, I haven't even talked to Carolyn about what we're going to give in this offering, let alone, you know, so I, I finally was like, baby, how much money do we even have in our bank accounts, can you just, can we log in and have this conversation and then just pray about it? And so she opens up all of our, our bank accounts digitally and she started listing them off. And, and to be honest, when she listed them off, I was kind of proud of myself, you know, because again, for a guy making minimum wage, you know, like she, I was like, wow, I can't even believe we saved that up. She was like, well, we have about 23 grand in mutual funds. We have about three grand in our checking. We've got about nine grand in our car fund. The moment she said car fund, I just thought of Dave Ramsey. It was like the spirit of Dave Ramsey entered in the room, just like I knew he was proud of me, like, well done, good and faithful saver. I just felt like, you know, I felt like he was there in the room, and I, I just, I was like, wow, like, we're doing pretty good. Like, I didn't realize that we had saved up all that money, and yet, again, we were, we were trying to decide how much we were going to give, 
And so, but literally the moment she listed it, all of a sudden I felt the whisper, the gentle voice of the Holy Spirit say, Peter, I want it all. I want you to give it all. And, at, you know, my, my first thought was, that can't be the Lord. I rebuke that in Jesus' name. You know, like, <laughs> there, there's no way. There's, I'll give it all. Like, there's no way. Or maybe, 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 you know, like sometimes, I mean, come on, we don't always hear from the Lord, right? Sometimes we got to clean out those spiritual ears. And maybe instead of, I want you to give it all, maybe he said, I want you to go to the mall. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll do that for you, Jesus. And then, but, but let me tell you, I got up in my head real fast. I was like, there's, I mean, like this, this, no, 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 no. It has to be the devil. It's the devil. I rebuke you, Satan, trying to get me to overzealously give all my money away and wreck myself. And, and, and then I thought, well, why would the devil want me to give more money to expand the kingdom of God? Okay, immediately, like, the truth was, I knew I was hearing from the Lord clearly. I was just too scared to obey in that moment. Because the idea, it was almost terrifying. I mean, don't get me wrong, my, my wife and I had always given tithes, and then we upped it to 15% when we could, and then we upped it to 20% when we could. But I mean, this was like a whole nother level. And I was like, God, I don't know. Immediately, I just, I, like just being fully honest, I immediately started thinking about the loser cruiser. I mean, God, how long is that car gonna last? It's already barely alive. You know what I'm saying? Like, how, like there's no way that car is gonna last. Like, like I, I started thinking about like the idea of living. I mean, this isn't gonna just set us back two years. This is gonna set us back five years. I mean, this is a commitment. I, I, I and I'm, Lord, I am so sick of, of, of showering in shifts on Sunday morning. Lord, where I, I don't want to brush my teeth at the kitchen sink. I want my own sink. I was just literally getting there in my head. And, and all of a sudden, my wife kind of snapped me out of it. She's like, Peter, hello, hello. How much, what do you think the Lord is calling us to give? And I remember taking a deep breath and I looked at her and I'm like, baby, you're gonna think I'm crazy, but, and I didn't even finish my sentence before she finished it for me. She goes, we're supposed to give it all, aren't we? We're supposed to empty our bank accounts just like we did when we planted this church. Let's do it. And she had, and she had that like crazy grin, like let's do it. Like, like, we, like we had when we first planted the church. And uh, I, I, I remember we pulled all of my family together. I pulled my three kids into the room and we, we told them what we were sensing and, and they were all like, you know, but we all had to commit. Because, you know, that meant sharing bedrooms, sharing bathrooms, all the, all the things. And, and uh, you know, we knew God was in it. And I, I got to be honest with you guys. Stories like this, they sound great when, when preachers share them. But let me tell you, it actually took a lot of work. And it was painful to get rid of all that money. In fact, there was an awkward that happened after that commitment that I think is also worth talking about. You know, I remember when I first called my financial advisor to, to explain what I was doing. Um, he, he, he goes, so... Do you, do you struggle with self-harm? Like, he thought I was, like, suicidal. You know what I'm saying? Like, and, and, like, you have to understand how awkward it is to try to even explain to people, like, why, yeah, you know, like, like my, even my family, vaca my parents, you know, like, the financial, the vacation. Like, I don't, I have to explain to everybody in my life. And then, and then there's, like, this additional grieving process that I had to go through. Every time I saw a nice car, every time I drove by a nice house, I had to grieve the fact that, hey, listen, I got to be content with what I got for the next several years. And, but it was the small stuff that, also bugged me the most like like literally like the moment I we we find finally gave away all the money uh, the moment we got there all of a sudden my snowblower died and you have to understand in Minnesota some of you are like I don't even know what a snowblower is okay it's like a lawnmower for snow okay so uh, but like in Minnesota we can get eight feet of snow easily okay so like to, to, when your snowblower dies this is not a luxury this is a necessity it'd be like trimming your yard with uh, hand clippers okay uh, shovel is not going to be fun, and I, I, but I can't afford it. I literally have to commit to a shovel all winter long, right, which, you know, boo-hoo, you get to work your muscles, but I was like, God, because it felt like everywhere I went, there were snowblowers for sale. I was at Home Depot, and I, there was this one great, gorgeous, shiny red snowblower with angels ascending and descending over it, and, and, uh, and, and it was, but it was on sale, and I still couldn't afford it, and I was like, I remember just like, I, it's, this sounds so weird, but when I saw that snowblower, just anger rose up inside of me. And it was like, God, like, I can't even, I can't even afford a snowblower. Like, did I make a mistake? 
Did, was I overzealous with that commitment? Did you even speak that to me or was that my overactive imagination? I was just like, I literally was walking around Home Depot kind of muttering like, God, are you faithful? I know that sounds kind of unspiritual, but I'm just being honest with you. And I, uh, 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 the reason why I remember it so much is because in the middle of that little wine session, uh, you know, I, you, you've heard of intercession and whining. It was whimper session. You know what I'm saying? Like I was whimper seating all over Home Depot and... Um, <laughs> My friend calls me up on the phone. He's like, Pastor Peter, you have to go to this one church with me tonight. And uh, my friend, he's a pastor from Scotland. He's gonna be preaching at this one church. I wanna introduce you to him after the service. Would you come to the service? And just being fully honest, I was not in the mood for a church service. I know that some of you that might like shatter your idea of what pastors are like. You know, I'm sure you think pastors just wake up. This is the day the Lord has made. You know, but I was like, I was not in the mood. I was, I was, I was like in my mind, I was like, I do not want to go into a worship service. I do not want to go to another church service. I don't want to listen to, I don't even want to meet your friend. Okay. But my, 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 uh, my friend kept saying, oh, Peter, Peter, trust me. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. Well, I begrudgingly went with him to this church, and I'm going to tell you, I did not enjoy a single moment of the worship because I wasn't thinking about God. You know what I was really thinking about? That snowblower. I was just like, God, did I make a mistake? I kept, I kept actually, I couldn't stop myself from repeating that. God, did I make a mistake by giving away the money? I was grieving. God, are you really gonna take care of my home when I take care of your home? It's really what I was, I was, I was saying to him. And, and of course, the Scottish preacher, he got up, he started preaching, and I was like three quarters of the way back through the auditorium, sitting like, you know, in the back. And all of a sudden, he stops and he looks at me and he goes, you with the blonde hair, with the, you know, blonde hair. And I was like, like, and he, he goes, you stand up. And, and I'm like, me? And I stood up. And he goes, the Lord just spoke to me, and this is what he says to you. You have answered God's call to produce wealth, and you have taken care of God's home, and he says he's gonna take care of your home in such a dramatic way that everyone around you will declare that God is sovereign in your life. And... He's going to bless you in a way that, that open up doors through it that no man can shut. It was almost like God directly answered the prayer that I was whimperceding in the middle of that service. You know what I'm saying? I was almost embarrassed afterwards. I almost felt like this holy fear of the Lord, like, Peter, shut up. Don't ever whine again. You know, like kind of thing. It was the weirdest thing. And I looked at my friend like, did you tell him anything? And he goes, no, I, I haven't talked to him in years, actually. We're going to, you know, like, I, so I'm freaking out, okay? So, so. As I was leaving the service that night, I get a phone call from an unknown number, and I, I answered it, and they were like, Pastor Peter, you don't know me. I, I go to your church, but I got, the, I got your phone number from one of the staff members. They told me to call you because I know this is going to sound really weird, but last week in the middle of the worship service, the Lord told me to buy you a snowblower, <laughs> and I wanted to drop it off at your house tonight. Would you, would you be okay with that? Okay, how weird is that? He didn't even ask me if I had a snowblower. He, I mean, for all the practical purposes, I could have had a glorious snowblower, and what he bought for me is lame. You know what I'm saying? Like, wh why, why? He had no idea. Nobody knew. Like, I just, and so sure enough, you know what? He came over that night, and guess what snowblower it was? It was the red, shiny snowblower with angels ascending and descending over it. I, I kind of freaked out. I, you know, if you, you, God is real. You know, like, I just, I was just like, it was so weird. To, and every time I see that snowblower, I have a Pentecostal revival. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm saying? It was just like, be, like, listen, listen. In the coming weeks, like, our church income skyrocketed by over a million dollars a year. Like, like crazy income. 
out of nowhere, all these book publishers started calling me. I mean, I had tried to get that door open for years, couldn't do it. And all of a sudden, boom, they're calling me. All of a sudden, major record labels are calling me up saying, hey, can you do a remix for so-and-so and, and, and this and that. And I, literally, somebody came up to me in church shortly after that and said, the Lord told me to give you $10,000 for your house. I don't know why, but here it is. What? Like, maybe that happens to you all the time, right? But for me, I was like, what is happening? Listen, in the following five years, our church assets jumped by over $30 million. And only God could have done it, okay? I, there's no way, I, I can't take credit for it. I'm kind of the whiner, weird, I'm like the Apostle Peter, right? I just, the bumbling guy that comes along for the ride, right? And, and the Lord said, mercy on me. And you guys might remember, last time I was here, I shared the story of my daughter having a vision of our downtown campus. Um, now, th that same year, God supernaturally gave us another church campus and in fact, here's a picture of that one year, God gave us two 1,300 seaters for pennies relative. The, the one on the left is the 130-year-old one, and the one on the right is our kind of our big box uh, building in the northern suburbs. And like, honestly, it was almost like God was just supernaturally showing us what he is capable of doing. And here's what I believe was going on here. And in the best explanation that I could, I could use to describe this is Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. And you're going to want to write this down, note takers. Hebrews 6, 10 says this. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. In other words, what this Bible verse is saying is that God has a disproportionate response to those who put his church first to establish his home, create a home for his kingdom, for other people to experience his kingdom. In fact, it's so important to God that, that it actually says that God would be unjust if he didn't give special favors to people that prioritize his people. Think about it. That's really what this verse is saying. Now, over the years, believe it or not, the science actually proves this, okay? I, I've been finding all sorts of crazy studies, major university studies, on how church attendance and, and loving God's church actually affects our lives, okay? It sounds really crazy, but there's actually a lot of data on it uh, by, by not even done by Christians, okay? Just lifestyle outcomes. Who's living the best life? Do you know what I'm saying? And check this out, okay? This is crazy stuff. For every statement I'm making, I have several major university studies to back it up, and it's this. If you go to church regularly, you are 22% less likely to be clinically depressed, okay? Actually, the rate of, of, of mental illness dramatically drops with frequency of church attendance, uh, you're more likely to manage your life better, more likely to manage your time better. You're more likely to complete degrees, uh, get higher grades, actually, achieve academic milestones. You're more likely to have mental, uh, increased mental well-being. You're, you're, in fact, uh, Christians have the least number of sick days of, of any demographic in corporate America or in, in school, okay, which is really weird. Um, and, and get this, as if these benefits weren't enough, regular church attendees live significantly longer than the general population, seven to 14 years longer than non-religious or inconsistent church attendees. In fact, epidemiologists, people that study epidemics, have actually found that church attendance is one of the biggest things you could do to extend your life expectancy even more than obesity and cigarette smoking. Like, for real. And if you're out there and you're like, does that mean I can be an obese smoker as long as I go to church every week? Okay, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try that. But I, I would say, you know, like, it... it, it it was actually shocking to me. They actually found that there's a higher uh, boost in immune system through church attendance, okay? I, it's crazy, and, and, and you, you have to read this. Again, if you're skeptical, I get it. My dad was a scientist. I have all of the research on my blog, peterhaas.org. Just put it, peterhaas.org, church attendance. You'll have all the stuff. Um, but this is the one that kind of blew me away. They found that married we, uh, church attendees who were married 
have the highest sexual satisfaction of any demographic in the entire United States, both in frequency and intensity. Say la. <laughs> Ooh, Daniel, that's that'll grow your church. I'm just saying. Some of you are already thinking, honey, where's the membership classes at? You know what I'm saying? Dream Team Day in the courtyard is just going to be overwhelmed with people today. It's going to be awesome, right? HC Connect, watch out. Here we come. You know what I'm saying? Notice I said married ch weekly church attendees, okay? Just clarify, okay? Not single Steve. Okay, so uh, anyway. Uh, notice I also said, according to the research, I did not say Christians experience these benefits. It, it technically is weekly church attendees, okay? In fact, the research found that any Christian who did not attend church at least four times a month, any Christian who had attend church less than four times a month, all of these statistical benefits would completely dissipate. In fact, actually, the least sexually satisfied group were Christians who attend, in all of the United States, were Christians that attend church every other week. That'll preach, too. <laughs> I'm just saying, it, okay, in fact, get this. This is, this is I, I, I can't make this up, okay? It, another study found that, that just having a weekly ministry in church increases happiness, by seven times more than Christians who merely attend church. Teenagers who, uh, teenagers with a weekly ministry are 75% less likely to walk away from their faith in college. All I'm saying is this, what if the Bible was true? Psalm 92, 13, planted in the house of the Lord, you will flourish. A place called home. What if God was calling you to be planted? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things that everybody else runs after will be added unto you, Matthew 6, Listen, when your pastors ask you to go to HC Connect or Dream Team Day just to get connected and sign up for a ministry, it's not for their benefit. Hear me. It's not for their benefit. It is for yours. You need ministry more than they need you in ministry. You need generosity more than they need your generosity. And, and ultimately, the only way to help you get there is to, is to help you exchange your bib for an apron. Bib for an apron. Now, they kind of are the same thing, aren't they? I mean, if you really think about what a bib is versus an apron, they're kind of the same thing. But actually, you know what they are? They require a mentality shift, how you approach life. It's a thought process. A bib means I'm a consumer. An apron means I'm a server. I'm here for other people. It's a different mentality. And I realize they look the same, but they're very different. And here's the deal. Babies are cute, but, you know, only for so long. You know what I'm saying? Like, at some point, uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a greater joy that comes by putting on the apron. That's why Jesus said there's more blessing in giving than there is in receiving, Acts 20, 35. You see, God wants you to be that experience that higher level of blessing, but how do you know if you're wearing a spiritual bib? Well, just listen to how you talk, okay? If I was to ask you, what kind of church are you looking for? What would you say? Would you say, would you give a bib answer? Like, I'm looking for a church that does this kind of worship, has this kind of preaching. It's like, it's all about me and how they're doing this. Or would you say, I'm looking for a church that's always needing me to go to an inconvenient church service time because they keep reaching so many lost people. I'm looking for a church that like demands that I invest more because the kingdom of heaven is the greatest return on investment. I'm looking for, you're like, how do you talk? You see, it reveals a mindset. And again, it's not bad to start out with a bib. We all start there. But over time, God wants to call us to that next level. And what that really is, is discipleship. Remember in the gospels, there were two groups of people that would always follow Jesus around. There were the, the multitudes, and then there were disciples. There were the crowds, it was another t name for multitudes. And then there were the disciples. And what were the difference? Well, I mean, if you look at even the miracle story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, remember the, the five loaves of bread and two fish, and he multiplies it and then feeds the 5,000, okay? I, I guarantee you the 5,000 probably didn't even know a miracle happened. Who knew about the miracle? The disciples. You see, I think there's a lot of people who get a meal instead of a miracle, because they have the bib on instead of the apron on. Listen, don't settle for a meal. 
Get the miracle. Be at the center of what God is doing. And how do you get there? By taking off the bib. Listen, there are people we count and people we count on. There are people who are problem finders and there are people who are problem solvers. There are people who are critics and there are people who are coaches. And really what it is is there are people who are, who are multitudes and people who are disciplers. You see, I, I'm just... I'm simply saying, hey, or like your pastor said, there's owners and there's tourists. All we're trying to do is call you into the higher level of joy that he has for you. And, and here's the deal. I'm not asking you to empty your bank accounts, but I am asking you to take the next step to really look inside. Maybe for some of you, that means consider tithing. Maybe for others of you, you're like, I can do way more than that. But you just haven't taken the step. I wanna invite you to take that step. And maybe you're here and you're like, all of that is too scary, Pastor Peter. Well, listen, then just start simple by going to the, the Dream Team Connect thing out in the, uh, you know, out, out in the courtyard or just sign up for a ministry team. Listen, it, it's, it's simple. And, and you guys hear me, I have nothing to gain by saying any of this. You realize that, right? I don't work here. I don't live here. This is not my home church. You know what I'm saying? Like, I am just an outsider coming in and telling you it is not normal for a church to get 1,100 people to give their lives to Christ in just a couple months. It is not normal for a church to grow by 600 people and now you have to add a Sunday evening service. Don't just get a meal when you could get a miracle. Don't settle for a bib when you could have that apron because let me tell you, Matthew 11, 12 says, since the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful people lay hold of it. People with aprons. I want that for you. And as one last story, just let me end with this, okay? At our downtown building, the one that my daughter had a vision of, Again, it's over 130 years old, and there's all these, like, if you go into the attic or in the, uh, into the basement, there's all these, like, crazy artifacts you can find, like, from forever ago. Like, I found pictures of, of Martin Luther King Jr. preaching in that church. I found pictures, the, the, the L.A. Lakers started in Minneapolis in our church. Uh, building. I found pictures of the original Minneapolis Lakers while they were, you know, very scrawny and very unknown. And uh, I, 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 there's the, the, one of the coolest things, though, is on the second floor of our building is this old painting of Christ as a 12 year old. And uh, it, there, there's like a picture I'll show you. It's like about six foot by six or seven foot by seven foot. Uh, painting of Jesus. It, it's from that Bible story where Mary and Joseph uh, accidentally left Jesus in Jerusalem, which is hilarious, by the way. But I, I just, and then he said, you know, he was wowing the teachers of the law as a 12 year old. Now, the reason why I loved that painting so much is it came with the building, and our church had just turned 12 when we got the building and that painting. And so it just felt so poetic. You know, 12-year-old Jesus, it was almost like God's birthday present for our church. And so every time I go preach there, I'd go up to the painting and I would just pray and thank God for it. God, thank you for being a part, like doing your miracles in my life. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would count me worthy of, of trusting for more miracles. And, and I was looking at the painting though, and you'll notice there's these tears in the painting from, you know, like little kids come up and just, you know, I would have been that kid. But I, I just, you know, I thought, you know what? We need to get this painting restored. We need to get it fixed up. And, um, but you know, where, where do you find people like that? Well, the, the, there's an art museum just down the road from us that has all these famous Monets and Picassos. Uh, and so they're just six blocks south of our building. And so, you know, I called them up and they have all these art restoration experts. They said, well, bring your painting down. So I brought it down. And they're looking at it, and the one person was freaking out, like, look at this. <gasps> and then it, it turned out that <laughs> that painting is actually a famous painting from an artist in the 1800s. And <laughs> it turned out that painting is worth more than all of our buildings. <laughs> Come on, you guys, only God can do this. God has a series of treasures stored up for you as well. The question is not, does he have treasures and crazy stories for you? 
the, the question is, are you going to get into alignment with his blessings? Because here's the deal. If your character and your generosity is not strong enough to withstand the weight of his blessings, everything that you, he blesses you with, you'll bow down and worship. He's, he loves you too much to bless you with things that would destroy you. And so my prayer for you is that you would start flexing that servanthood muscle, that generosity muscle, and that you'd be ready to handle the weight of God's crazy adventures that he has for you. Would you just bow your heads, close your eyes? God, you see all the dreams in this room? You see all of the stuff, the worries, the burdens, the chaos, and yet you have something that would lift all of those burdens. And Lord, your word says that when we build your home, that you take care of our homes, Lord, that when we seek first the kingdom, all these things that other people run after will be added unto us. I pray that you'd help us to learn how to apply that in whatever way that you have for us. And, and especially, Lord, for the people that maybe they're new here and maybe new to this whole God thing, I pray that wherever they're at in relationship to you, that they would take that step closer to you starting right here and now. And maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ. Listen, today is your day to go on that adventure and you can do it by simply repeating a little prayer after me. And if you are open to it even remotely, just say this after me, say this. Say, dear Jesus, forgive me, renew me, and lead me starting today. In Jesus' name, we pray. Hey, listen, if you just made that prayer, prayed that prayer, throw your hand up in the air so we can celebrate you. Just be bold about it. It's okay. Throw your hand up all across this auditorium. See? Come on. Come on. I love you guys. I bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go in peace.